right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I must say, it is so nice to have some familiar faces back. We have some teachers joining today's broadcast that I haven't seen in several months, and so it's so nice to welcome you back in as we continue to showcase and celebrate amazing exploration, science, and conservation from around the globe. Now, if you guys have been joining us over the last couple of years, or even if you're new to us and just discovered us last week, you will know that we live for bringing adventure into classrooms. But even by that standard, even by some of the coolest people that we get the chance to feature on these broadcasts, one of my very favorite groups is joining us today, and that is the exploration vessel Nautilus. For those who don't know, the Nautilus is the most iconic, amazing research vessel on this planet, and what they have a mission to do is explore some of the uncharted regions of the ocean to discover new species, new things, new places. The oceans are uh, a treasure trove of so many incredible places to discover. And so if you want to check them out at Nautilus Live, check them out on social media here. I'll bring up those links at the end of the broadcast as well. Uh, there is just so much to discover. But today specifically, we are hanging out with an in the Pacific remote islands marine national monument. Say that five times fast. Specifically, we are going to learn what they are discovering at Cayman Reef in the Palmyra Atoll. And helping us do that are Brandy and Coralie. So without further ado, I'll stop talking. I'll turn it over to our experts for the day. Thank you so much for joining us today, ladies, and tell us what you've been discovering out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, everyone. My name is Brandy Jones. I'm from Houston, Texas, and I'm serving as a science communication fellow on this expedition. And I'm Corley Rodriguez. I'm a graduate student, and I'm one of the scientists on this expedition. And do you want to tell them about our uh, mission or the goal for what we're here for? Yeah. So our goal for uh, uh, so our goal for this um, cruise uh, is to explore around Kingman and Palmyra Seamounts, which are part of the U.S. Exclusive Economic Zone or EEZ, which is 200 nautical miles from land, and it's the region where uh, the United States is able to. Um, Kind of exploit the resources of the area so we just want to understand better what is in this area and uh, what resources there are and new species and rocks and um, kind of learn a little bit more about these ancient seamounts yeah and i have the privilege of uh participating in two watches a day where we so i'm um, saying remotely operated vehicles deep into the ocean and explore um, lots of different corals and um, volcanic rocks to determine a lot more information about what's actually down there. Fantastic. And so these watches, how long are you actually there? Like, are you on a bunch of screens? Are the screens behind you or you're doing some of this research or what's going on? Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're in the studio right now, but back there you can see the van, which is where we have our watches. So the first row that you see is the science row, which is the row that Brandy and I sit in. And then the row in the front is where the ROV pilots and the video engineers sit. So they're the ones who are in charge of driving the vehicles, uh, telling the ship where to go, uh, making sure everything is good with the vehicles and getting really great shots. And um Amazing. And so this area that you're in now, how long are you actually exploring it? And how long is the whole journey? So when you, how long are you actually at sea total? And then specifically in this area with the Green National Monument? So uh, we're wrapping it up, actually. So we've been out here for almost three weeks. Um, and yeah, we've gone to Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we had a three... Oh, we had a three-day transit um, from Honolulu to this area, and then from there, we have been exploring, and then we just started transiting back uh, yesterday night. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you have any pictures or videos or anything that you can share with us that we can bring up for classes, or do you want to just tell us some of the things that you found? Sure. Um, let's see here. First, I can go to some of the highlights that we have on our website, um, nautiluslive.org. And give me a moment. Take your time. I'll bring that up on a banner for folks as well. So if you guys want to check this out, I'll put it in our YouTube chat as well. But oh, we're getting the chance to explore and see some of these. Way to go. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
All of the things that I'm about to show you are on the website, nautiluslive.org. And this is a really cool creature. It's a sea urchin. But um, when you look at it, it, it all, almost resembles a little bit of an anemone. But here's one of the cool little creatures we found. And if you look um, on the screen, it was found at about 1,743 meters in depth. And if you see those two green laser lights, those are more of a measurement tool. Um, they're 10 centimeters apart, just to give you a better idea of the size of that organism. So this is one thing we've um, found while out at sea. Yeah. Corley, do you know much about those? I don't. I'm a geologist, so <laughs> the biology yeah. goes a little bit over my head. Well, so that's Let's a great question, here. actually. You're, you're a geologist. We've got biologists on the crew. Like, how many different kinds of scientists and engineers does it take to go on this expedition and sort of bring back all this information? How big is the crew that you guys have out there? Yeah, so each watch has eight people per watch, and there's three different watch schedules, so that's at least 24 scientists right there, and then we have, I think, three, one, two, I think three or four extra people who aren't sitting on watches, but are either um, data engineers or mapping coordinators or things like that, so I think it's around 30, maybe a little bit under 30 people of total, mm -hmm. of the whole science team. Yeah, thanks, Corley. Brandy, you were going to show us something else, too, it sounded like. <laughs> yes, um, so I'm going to look up some, uh, show you some more things that we have discovered um, while out at sea. I'm gonna... So a part of the mission was also to observe different types of corals, deep sea corals. Almost there. It just builds up extra anticipation when it takes a second to buffer, I think. It's more fun that way. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Are the internet on board. So here is um, an example of some of the things that we've seen. This is a crinoid, correct? Mm -hmm. lot, lot be beautiful, very beautiful uh, sea animals on board. Um, this is another one of... Uh, Bumber, a bubblegum coral, and then there's a brittle sea star wrapped around it. And we see lots of these uh, sea stars. Chanacops, different fish. And here's a um, very strange looking uh, anemone and yellow crinoids. And we also notice lots of different sea sponges. Here's an eel, an eelfish, and the ghost shark. Ooh. <laughs> um, we have explored lots of different uh, sea mounts and ridges, and um, in these areas, we've seen lots of different um, corals that grow like what you see here and also the sponges and this is what they call a sea cucumber there are lots of them anemones and lots of sea cucumbers fantastic look beautiful. at these things. oh Beautiful. It's worth, worth <laughs> noting too. You mentioned at the beginning that these are animals, and I mean, a lot of them to uh, an untrained eye look like plants. They look like something that we sort of see, like a tree uh, up on land. But they're all things that actually eat things that are near them, which is really freaky to think about. Some of the coolest things live in the deep ocean. You talked about sea cucumbers; they can regrow whole organs, like things eat their organs and they regrow the whole thing, which is wild and freaky. Um, so, some really spectacular creatures. And you mentioned too, 1,700 meters is over. Uh, that's yeah. It's it's a mile down. Um, so you're, you're having these uh, vehicles go down. Are they vehicles with people or are they just robots that you guys are operating from inside the ship? Uh, they're all ROVs. So we have two ROVs that we utilize on most of our dives. And the first one is Argus, which is our heavy one that um, it kind of takes all of the wave and bounce of the ship. 
Um, and then that one is tethered to Hercules, which is the one where we get amazing imagery. So all of these pictures you're seeing um, are taken with Hercules. It also has grab arms that we use to collect different samples. So we can collect just by grabbing samples. You can see in the front, um, there's a box. And we also have slurps, so we can slurp things up. There's a little tube that I don't know if you can see in the picture, but um, there's a little tube that can slurp things up. We can also take Niskin samples, which are water samples in the ocean. Um, and yeah, I think. Oh, and we have a, a core so we could take a sediment cores as Very well. Cool. So imagine you're a deep Another sea thing. I, I... Oh, go ahead, Brandy. Sorry. <laughs> Did you tell them about the eDNA also? Oh, yeah. So for the Niskin samples, uh, what we use those for, or the water samples, is we do environmental DNA analyses on those. Um, so we're collecting them and then filtering them for um, another scientist back on shore to do that. Uh, but eDNA just stands for environmental DNA. So when there's organisms that are around the area that we're studying, uh, especially areas with really high biodiversity, really dense biodiversity uh, we can take these uh, samples and uh, tissues will slough off of other animals that have been in the area but aren't there right now so then we get a better picture of the type of animals that live in these communities i'm so glad you mentioned this because so few groups talk about eDNA and it's one of the coolest things in science in the last 20 years by like a huge margin like the fact that instead of having to go and get the individual animal and get the dna from it you could just sample a water column or sample the air now like they're getting really high tech with this and you can understand all the species that live in the area is mind blowing. Um, and so yes. I mean, what is this work being put towards? I mean, for some of us that are landlocked in the middle of a continent, the idea of going out to the deep sea somewhere no one's ever been collecting some DNA, what is that going to be used for? Is it for conservation? Is it for just general knowledge and understanding? Like what's the purpose of all this? I think it could be for both. So I think it's since there, a lot of these seamounts we're exploring are previously unexplored. And so the areas we're going to, everything we're seeing is completely new and novel. Like this is stuff we've never seen before. Right. So it's really important to know just what types of animals are around these areas, especially as we start to move into um, kind of a, a area where we think we might start a blue economy era. So if we're thinking we might start utilizing uh, these areas more, we want to make sure that we're protecting, you know, animals and we want to know what we're protecting. So just like on land, if you're going to build a, a, a town or a city or, or an oil well or something where people are having a big impact on the area, it really helps to understand how that's going to impact a local community of organisms. And so in the deep sea, we've never really done that in a very serious way. So much of the deep sea is unexplored. And so expeditions like yours help us make sure that we're not going to have an outsized impact on places and organisms that are, are really worthy of protection. That's correct? Yeah, that's definitely the hope. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Cool. So, ladies, is there anything else that really jumps out, or would you like to start diving in with questions from some of our, our live audience today from classes all over the world? Or anything else big? I want to make sure I don't steal your thunder. Um, another cutie that we mm -hmm. found on the expedition is a, a Dumbo octopus. Um, let's see if I can... Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to see uh, the Dumbo octopus. There, we saw three, and the first one we saw kind of was, like, floating away from the camera, so we didn't really get a good view of it. And then on one of my watches, we saw a little tiny Dumbo octopus, and then on my last watch, we were able to see a really big Dumbo octopus and follow it around for a little bit. But I was super lucky because I think they're so cute. <laughs> they are. They're adorable. I, I like how your professional scientific detachment is gone. It's like, they're so cute. They're the best. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. Oh, he's beautiful. Oh, wow. And so you send the Argus Hercules down there, and you don't know that these things are going to pop up. Like, this is, it's always a lucky thing to find a creature like this when you go into the deep sea, right? Yeah, definitely. Especially uh, creatures that can swim really easily don't like oh. We cut out a bit. See, the Dumbo Octopus is too cute and it froze our, froze our broadcast. 
I mean, if you're going to freeze on a picture, that is the one to freeze on. But we're going to hopefully get Brandy and Coralie back in a second. This is the thing when you're on a ship that's in the middle of the ocean. Is maybe there's like a big wave and it blocks out the signal for a second. Uh, we'll see if we can get them back. Oh, there they are. They're back. You 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 spoiled us. You gave us this jump, Dumbo octopus picture and then it cut out and froze right on it. So tell oh, us no. more. <laughs> you're back, though. It's good. Uh, yes. Did he? Um, what was you the last broke, thing yeah, you heard? <laughs> you broke up a little bit. We couldn't. That's okay. You were just showing us uh, the octopus had just started swimming. You were telling us about the fact that when you go to the deep sea, you don't necessarily expect to find these things. It's always a lucky opportunity to find them. And that's where we were when you a uh, big trough of a wave cut out your signal or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the waves are really big. Uh, we actually were supposed to start transiting back today, but we we're going a little bit earlier because. Um, it was going to be a little bit of a mess if we tried to go fast back to back to home. Um, but yeah, so we never expect to see these animals and especially animals like Dumbo octopus or fish. Uh, they can swim really fast. And so it's hard to get good imagery of them because um, they can sense when Hercules and Argus are there. And so they tend to swim away really quickly. So we were able to... Um, get some really good footage of this Dumbo octopus and follow it around a little bit. And we got to see the underside of it, which is always a really cool and like weird looking <laughs> area of the octopus. Um, but yeah. Fantastic ladies. And I, I love that you mentioned the fact that most animals, when you go down, do tend to flee. I mean, you've got a picture, you're an animal that's about this big and suddenly this gigantic robot, you guys get the chance to see it on the deck in one of those earlier pictures, shows up and it's terrifying. It would be like a transport truck following you around. And you're sort of like, oh no. Uh, and so it's this unique <laughs> ability to see uh, an ecosystem that no one, like, no one gets to see and that the animals aren't used to things coming that are like that because as we've said, no one's ever been there before. So what a special, what a special, special thing. Um, Brandy Corley, thank you so much for, for all of this. And if you're good with it now, I'll head to our live classes, head to our YouTube classes. And if there is anything else you'd like to show us, any images or videos, we can absolutely bring those up over the next 20 minutes or so. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. Excellent. Well, as I said at the top of this broadcast, we've got groups from all over the U.S. and Canada. So I'm going to start us off with Mr. Lavogue's class, joining us in North Palm Beach, Florida, uh, grade six, seven. If you want to come in and ask a question, you're all set. Hi, guys. Sounds great. Thank you. Arthur, go ahead and ask a question. What's the most surprising thing you have seen with the ROV? The most surprising thing, Brandy and Corley. The most surprising thing. Um, the, I would say ROV. I was also... The ROV. The most surprising thing I was able to see uh, was that ghost shark. It's called a chimera, and uh, they're kind of. I've been told from some of the biologists they're kind of a weird mix of like they have an ancestor of shark and fish, but um, they kind of branched off. And I think their oldest ancestor is from 400 million years ago. Um, so they're these kind of like ancient sea creatures. And uh, they look crazy and kind of creepy, and I don't know, they're really cool. <laughs> nice. um, for myself on watch, one of the coolest things I've seen was the, it was a jumping anemone. Mm. Um, the footage hasn't been put on the website yet, but please stay tuned. It was a, a very <laughs> cool little dark purple anemone, and next thing you know, it jumped. I was like, whoa, <laughs> so it was cool. I've never heard of anything like that, so that's very wild. I like the first one you showed, too, with the cool, like, feather bit sticking out on the top. Like, what a weird adaptation. The Chimera, by the way, if I encourage everyone to look these up when you're done the broadcast. The shot that they got was from a little bit further away. Sometimes you'll see them in Aquaria, and they literally look like a Frankenstein's monster. Like, they look like they have panels that have been stitched on. They're so freaky and so fantastic, so... Great question, Mr. Lavoe, guys. Um, all right, our one, two, multi-age class. Let's head to you guys joining us today. Uh, and I'll bring bring you right in our broadcast. Oh, it wants to work. There we are. Hi, Illinois. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So sorry. Go ahead. How can kids in Illinois help the ocean? Nice. Did you catch that, ladies? Yeah, how can kids in Illinois help the, help the ocean? Um. Oh. So uh, in the deep sea, we haven't really seen the effects of climate change yet. 
Uh, but that is something that, you know, we're looking at um, because the effects of climate change are mostly we see them taking effect in the top or the upper ocean. So, but to have a completely healthy ocean, you want um, everything to be healthy. So you want the upper ocean to be healthy for the lower ocean to be healthy because there is um, migration. There's a lot of vertical migration of certain species. Um, so definitely making sure you recycle, reduce your plastic because they're starting to find plastic in a lot of these animals um, and sea creatures. Um, and then we end up finding them in humans as well. Um, and, you know, being sh like making sure that your politicians are <laughs> oh, right. for kids, like making sure that you're learning as much as you can about ocean conservation and ocean work and making sure like you're helping your parents understand what's important and, you know, just being a, a good learner and learning about things is probably true. there's so much that we don't know. And, you know, being, you know, a leader in something like this is really important. It's something we really need. Yeah. I, I love that answer, Carly. And honestly, I think that you two were probably kids. I was certainly a kid that I was walking around flicking lights off my house and turning off taps when there was too much water being done and packing litterless lunches. <sighs> but it really does make a huge difference. We've seen on your voyages, on other voyages to the deep sea, there's plastic down there. And on the most remote islands in the world, there's plastic on the beaches. And, you know, it, it's troubling to see, but for our students, especially younger students, everyone sees that and feels the same way. No one looks at a beach covered in plastic and goes, great, we all recognize that's a problem. And so the little actions that we do where we don't make plastic waste really does go a long way to helping protect amazing places like the, the areas that you've had the chance to explore. So great answer. I'm, I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks, guys. All right. Miss Bowles class, we, 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 we just finished off with our grade ones, and now we're going to head up to our grade 11s. Uh, joining us in Goderich, so Miss Bowles group, if you guys want to come on in, you're good to go. Hey, Jesse, one of our questions was how many new species they've discovered on this mission. Nice. Oh, that is a good question. Uh, and the answer is we don't know. Once we take the samples in, uh, the scientists will come and collect them and either uh, – store them in formalin or ethanol and uh, then we send them out to a, a museum at Harvard and there they can do they can uh, describe the animal and look at the taxonomy and determine if the animal is a new species or not but uh, we were collecting some sponges that we don't know what they are and so we're hoping that they're new species but we won't know until we uh, ship our samples off. Very cool. And by the way, I love the subtext of that question, which is the idea that basically every time we explore the deep sea, every time the uh, Nautilus goes out on a voyage, you do find new species. Like that's the thing with this ecosystem is that 99% of it is unexplored. So every time we take the opportunity to look, we find new incredible creatures, uh, which is, is so, so much fun. Before I take one more question for you in a second, I want to note you keep mentioning sponges. Everyone should look up sponges when they're done, because most of us think sponges, we think the thing we wash ourselves with. Sponges, uh, quite a few of them, are something called totipotent, which means that you can literally run them through a cheese grater and they all disintegrate and they'll form back together and make a body again, which is really freaky and one of the neatest things in all of nature. And people under overlook that because they look like a big blob on the bottom of the ocean, but they're super cool. Um, Brandy Corley, I, I wanna ask, before we go back to Mr. Lavoe's class, how did you get on this voyage? Like, this is the coolest gig of all time to be in this special ship with these amazing people in this incredible place. Uh, what's your backdrop to ending up where you are talking to us today? Well, um, I'm actually an educator. So I'm from Houston, Texas, where I serve as a STEM uh, coordinator, as well as a science specialist on my campus. And um, I've been in education for 15 years. So one day I attended a STEM conference and from there I met someone by the name of Megan Cook and she held a uh, session on ocean exploration and she talked to us about um, allowing educators, they bring educators on board to witness real live um, exploration happening and showed us all of the new species that have been found and I was blown away and I applied and here I am today for the second time. Actually, my first time was in 2019. And then this is my second time back on the ship. Kudos for you, Brandy. We've had Megan on many times. She's amazing. That's wonderful. Uh, yes, she is. <laughs> What's your story? Yeah, so 
Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island uh, in geological oceanography. And so I'm actually studying some of the rocks that we're finding on the ocean. So I'm not studying the lavas, but once you get lavas or once you can get sediment, there's this thing that forms on top of it called ferromanganese crust. And so that's what I study. Uh, ferromanganese crust is really enriched in economically valuable metals like cobalt, nickel, and manganese. And um, they also form on really long time scales. So about one to 10 millimeters per million years is like how fast they grow. So we think that they could be really good recorders of uh, paleo oceanography and help us reconstruct past paleo uh regimes. So I'm just trying to, there's so little we know about them. They're kind of more of a semi-recent discovery. And so I'm just trying to learn as much as I can about them. So again, just to, to clarify for all our students today, the idea is that with this, this amazing sort of, I guess, geological form on the bottom of the ocean, you can understand what the ocean was like millions of years ago, which is super cool. Yes? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, right now there's a bunch of different, we call them paleo proxies, which a proxy is just like something you can use in place of something else. So you can use a proxy, like, let's say how much cobalt there is in this crust. And I can say, well, I know that for this much like cobalt, there needed to be this much oxygen in the water column. Now I know that there is this much oxygen five million years ago. Yeah, we've, um, for our students today, I know some of you might be familiar with BBC series, our big PBS series. So Cosmos, uh, one of the bigger science series in the last few years, talks about manganese in the bottom of the ocean and some of the amazing things it's been able to record. So very, very cool for our students today. Uh, guys, we're going to do one more round of questions. If you're on YouTube and you want to share there, please do. But let's head back to North Palm Beach. Mr. Lavogue's class, whoever comes up next has to have as good hair as the first guy. That's the deal. Well, if you have a second question, go for it. Yeah, oh yeah, we've got more. Uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, who paid for all this? Yes, I, we always get this question. I love it. <laughs> who so pays how, for all of this? Yeah, how do you fund this? Like, what's the cost for an expedition like yours, and where does that come from? And I, I think it's always a great question for our deep sea expeditions. Yeah, so actually the people who are funding this expedition are the same people who are funding my uh, PhD work. Um, it's the Ocean Expert, it's NOAA's Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. So they work with a couple of different um, institutions, uh, URI included, uh, Huey, University of New Hampshire, University of Southern Mississippi, um, and a couple others. And uh, so they're funding this cruise, but there's other funders. Um, so I think Nat Geo also funds some of the Nautilus cruises. Noah can fund some of the Nautilus cruises. And then, um, so I'm not only going on Nautilus cruises for my PhD, I also plan on going on some Yulmo's uh, cruises, uh, which is the US fleet of ships that we have. And a lot of those get funded from the National Science Foundation. Fantastic. You can check out, by the way, anyone who wants to find out can check out the expedition partners of the Nautilus on nautiluslive.org. And I always love the money question because when it comes to big, large scale science, whether it's particle physics, deep sea exploration space, we always get this question like, how is it funded? Because it's, it's tens and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars to put these expeditions together. And I always like to stress that that is like, I think the U.S. science budget is like 2% of all the things that the U.S. does. In Canada, it's something similar around the world. So this very, very small percentage of all the funding that goes to everything that happens goes towards all this science and exploration, this new way of understanding the world and universe around us and the development of new technologies and all sorts of amazing things that stem from that investment into STEM. Uh, so I, I love that question. Thank you, Mr. Lobos class. And, and do check out that website for more. All right, back to Illinois, our very enthusiastic young friends. Come on back in. Hey, guys. What is the hardest thing about living on the Nautilus? Nautilus. What is the hardest thing about living on the Nautilus? Perfect. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I think uh, the weather was a little bit hard for our transits, as we've uh, said before. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, new people on the ship who'd never been out. So this is Brandy, both Brandy and my uh, second time coming out on Nautilus. Um, so I think we may have had like a little bit of help in that area. So we kind of knew what to expect. But a lot of people are really sick and are really sick <laughs> yeah. right now. Um, so that's probably the hardest thing I would say is people, yeah. people being sick <laughs> on, yeah. on the ship. 
And for me, I suppose just being away from my family, you know, I do have children. And so um, I thought this was a great opportunity to share with my community. But um, being away from my children is a little difficult, but it's well worth it. You get the chance to speak with them daily or quite often, yes, from the ship because you have the connection capability. Is that true? Yeah, we can use uh, the Internet. Uh, I can call them, but I can't use uh, video calls for so just to protect the bandwidth of the ship. So, yeah. So it's, I'm really happy you mentioned that. The seasickness thing is something we get with all ocean expeditions. Joe had the chance to go in the ship for those who've seen him most. And I mean, I think the ship tilted 35 degrees, which is unfathomably far. Uh, but Brandy, I'm really happy you mentioned the kid element to this. This is something that's lost in a lot of our exploration talks is that if you go on an expedition, you are gone from your family, you're gone from your community and friends. And that is a big and, and difficult challenge. I think it does make you the coolest mom in the world. Um, and when you come back, everyone's gonna be just like over the moon excited about you. But uh, I, I'm, I think that's an important note for our students that might conceive of a future in which they get to go on expeditions like this. So thank you very much for sharing that. Oh. Um, Oh, could you, oh, we didn't hear you, you, uh, we lost connection briefly. Oh, what did you say again? That, that's okay. I was telling the classes that I'm just so glad that you shared that that's your biggest challenge. A lot of people don't talk about the fact that it is difficult to leave family behind and friends behind. And oh, yes. Really important. And, and you are the coolest person of all time, though, for doing it. Like, you go back home and people think you're the greatest <laughs> thing ever, which is pretty cool. I mean, <laughs> that's a part. Um, let's wrap up in a minute, guys, with Miss Ball's class. We're going to head back to Goddard for one more question. Uh, take us away, grade 11s. I don't know if this is the pessimist in me or not, but I was just wondering if there's any chance the DNA you're finding, that eDNA, has washed there from other areas? How do we know it's from species that actually live in the area? Great question. Um, so I, I don't actually <laughs> know, uh, I don't do, I don't study the eDNA. Um, we're mostly collecting, I think, uh, for, uh, scientist M. Everett, um, and so, or Meredith Everett. And, uh, so I think she's just trying to get as many water sample or filters, um, as possible. Um, I'm, can you repeat the question again also? Yeah. <laughs> so, in my yeah. best to no, no, it's a great question. By the way, I was looking this up as you were talking about it, and when you type in eDNA, of course, it's Edna, and the character from Incredible shows up, which is not what I'm looking for. Um, the, question, <laughs> the question is, when you're, so you, you send a sample down, you grab a sample of water, you take that back to the lab, and it says, oh, there's these 50 species there. How do you know it's from things that are actually in that water, as opposed to there's a shark 800 miles up the coast, and his DNA just washed there? Like, how can you tell that? Is it the, and you might not know this offhand, is it the amount of DNA in the water? Is there some sort of benchmark where we know that it's something that's local? It's a great question. That is a great question. And I unfortunately don't know, but um, I have done water sampling for my work before where I was looking, where I'm looking at uh, cobalt in the water column. Um, and so I think where, I don't know. I'm assuming for like water sampling where we take it, we're assuming that it's like fairly uniform and generally like that area that we're taking uh, the Niskin sample. Um, so I wonder if it might be the same for eDNA. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not sure, unfortunately. No, I've, I've actually never heard this question come up and it's different on land than it is in the water. Because on the land, if you take a DNA sample from a bit of soil, obviously something had to go by there in some fashion. In the water, you do have that capacity for sort of contamination. Um, it's a very cool question. Miss Ball, I'll try and find that out for you as well. But see, this is half the fun of broadcast is we get to stump the scientists and educators. Uh, so <laughs> that's why we do this work in the first place. Um, Brandy Corley, this has been so, so much fun. Is there any last message you want to share with our kids about where they can keep the learning going, about your own experiences, about anything you want to leave us off with? I'd love to hear from both of you. Um, I would say for me, uh, just keep being curious and asking questions. I never, when I was, you know, grade one or two, grade 11, I never thought I would end up on a ship like this and be doing research. Um, and the only reason why I was is because I just kept asking questions about things that were interesting to me. And eventually I ended up here. Mm -hmm. um, and I get to do interesting, cool things every day on the ship. And then I get to go home and to my university and I get to do more research there and keep asking questions and keep learning new things. And 
it's I'm super grateful <laughs> for that. Yeah, for me, it would also be to never be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. Um, always be open to new opportunities because it can be the most rewarding experiences. Ladies, I absolutely love those answers. A lot of the people that we bring on the broadcast act like they, you know, were meant to be there and they always belong. And I think the highlighting the fact that a lot of people are just so overwhelmed and excited about these opportunities that they're given is really special for our kids today. I think it's, it's my favorite message we get across is that if you guys are keen on things like this, volunteer, get involved, learn more, reach out. Scientists and educators love to have people reach out to them, telling them how cool they are and asking how they can get involved. It's like our favorite thing in the world. So for our students today, do feel free to do that. Check out NautilusLive.org. So many great things there. We'll get to see that cool jumping anemone that Brandy told us about. I'm excited about that. Uh, check them out on social media. Again, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the works. They do so much uh, work for education. It's spectacular. Um, and just thank you both so much for joining us today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. No problem at all. Have a good one. Yeah, we'll bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell as well. Bye, guys. Have a wonderful day. See you all soon.